Now, hello and welcome to the round table on the topic of personal stories and new sub subjectivity in theater. We are today with a group of mostly younger artists who has provided us with the core kind of selection of this festival this year, which is a one, all, almost all of them are one on one performances, um, which somehow question um, the relationship between one audience member and one narrative they co create in a mutual space. Um, the performances, although sometimes short, are on the edge of uh, experience more than a, specta a spectator's um, gaze, which provides a new, I would say, a sort of active gaze or more participatory audience member who becomes a subject of the performance as well. With us uh, today are Joe Bennon from UK, Maria Lucia Cruz Coreana from Portugal, Belgian-based artist, Harry Giles from UK, Javier Popes from Spain, Janek Turkowski from Poland, and, and Gregory Dudas and Adeline Nitsa um, from the group still based in Austria. So, because of the very fragile dramaturgy of, the, of all of the pieces, and my, I have a very big um, fear that I will spoil <laughs> anyone's experience who did not yet see the performance. I think it would be the most um, appropriate to start um, start the round by introducing the artist and the projects in the sense um, how much I are willing to share about the, the performance itself. So maybe we can start with Maria. So I should tell a little bit about the project. Yeah. About, uh, okay. So Common Dreams is uh, well, it's a floating platform on the river where I take you on a journey through the waters, and I steal a little bit of your time and I pull you away of your normally daily life. Um, the idea is that you somehow disconnect um, with your material capitalistic. Uh, form of living, and we dream about uh, a new future after a, po a post-apocalyptic scenario, which means that the, the city got totally flooded, and you have to reimagine how a society will be built on the water. So you give time to think about how uh, maybe a political system will be installed, if it will be installed, if there will be leaders ruling this new society, if you would uh, be able to find water or uh, food, food to survive. So it's more like it takes you to a space where you haven't been before and you are confronted with your survival skills. So this is what is about performance. Um, so I'm Harry, hello. Uh, my performance is called What We Owe. Um, and it's about debt, uh, obligation, owing, um, and it takes the form of a. It's a conversation. It's very. It's a conversational performance, and it takes the form of a mock debt counselling service. So we talk through um, the debts, uh, the obligations in the participants' life, and then try and make a plan for dealing with them, um, or trying to forgive them if we if we can. Um, so it's about 15, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how, how much you want to talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Hello. So we are performing for Silk Fugitive's company. Uh, the piece is called I Will Dance You Till the End Of. And uh, it's been created in 2014. It's been performed in more than one festival already. And uh, this piece is kind of a, a self-reflection where one has a, a chance to experience oneself uh, in a way one would not expect. And I'm trying to not do too much spoilers here, but um, it does involve uh, a bit of dancing, a bit of communication. And, and uh, it depends very much on what our 
viewer brings us of how each performance turns out to be. And it's fun. Yeah, around 15 minutes. Hi, I'm Jo, uh, and I'm presenting a performance called Exposure. I am mean, probably going to give you some spoilers, so sorry. Um, the performance takes place in total darkness, um, with a few moments of exposure or illumination, moments of light. Um, and in the work, I'm interested in how we look, so physically the mechanics of how the eye and the brain work, but also um, how we look at each other, how we are looked at, and what the difference is between looking and being seen. And so um, the darkness feels very important in that respect, in that there's a provocation from me in the work about how we might see each other in a non-visual sense. So if we remove um, light, if we remove visual information, then how can, maybe, maybe that's the way that we see each other more clearly. Uh, and it's very, very short, nine minutes. I'm the quickest. <laughs> My name is Xavi Boves, I'm coming from Spain. And the show is called Things Easily Forgotten. It's a show for five people, 75 minutes long. And it's a show that uh, I don't talk about it that much, but it's about uh, little things that surround us in the everyday life and we don't take that much attention in the history, in Spain, but they think that they are universal from anywhere and also linked with lots of pictures from a period in Spain that was really important for us and that it's still going on somewhere. Uh, that's it. Hello, my name is Janek and uh, I just bought some films on the flea market some years ago and then uh, I started to dig into this material and uh, the show is uh, around one hour for 15 person and is telling about this curiosity uh, about the other's life and what do we can what we could find there and why we we'll dig for it what uh, what is if we meet the person in person after this experience so I think that's all about it. Maybe I would start also like until we start the discussion somehow to see um, because this solo show okay now I see that it's uh, one one performance and then this are more like um, um, exploration pieces for the small number of audience uh, but what was interesting for me is to see was that um, aesthetic need to do this sort of a situation or um, a production need because it does something interesting to the production value of. of Art and in a sense it's easy to travel but then there is no additional value to it and how does this combination especially in a festival uh, kind of situation um, allows you to co-create this spaces <coughs> of the audience and how did you actually well the most bottom line maybe is how did you develop the piece and how did you and why did you insist on this um, specific situation between you and the audience member yeah, yeah. Um, I I started making <laughs> I started making one to one performances because it was cheap <laughs> and I had no money and uh, I couldn't find any money. Um, it's actually no, it's it's cheap in materials and very expensive in time. So if you're willing to exploit yourself or in your you're in a situation where you cannot find good pay, then. Uh, uh, it works very well, um, and I also I keep pursuing it because there is something uh, inherently absurd and, and, and impossible. Um, and the, the, the one to one performance refuses uh, market dynamics because you, you cannot 
you cannot sell it. It does not function on ticket sales. It has to. Be, if you want to be paid, it has to be funded because you can, because you cannot do enough performances to afford it. Right. So so I enjoy this aspect of it that it is economically ridiculous. Um, uh, so that says something about what art can can be. But then for this particular performance, it was I wanted to make something about debt and how um, the idea of debt structures our lives and our thinking, especially um, in, in my experience, especially in, in, in historically Christian societies. Uh, Christianity is a is a very debt-based religion. Very much like it, there's, there's a, a significant philosophy of debt in the Bible. Um, in Scotland, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, um, the, you know, the, the kind of the big prayer in the in the Bible, it, it translates differently in different places. In England, the English Bible translates, "Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us." In Scotland, it's "Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors." Um, so, so debt is the structuring idea, this idea that you are always obligated to other people um, and that, that you are owed something or you owe people. And I think that structures how we think about things. But also in the Bible, I'm not a Christian by the way, but I, did, I, grew, up on a, I grew up on a very small and very Christian island. Um, so uh, I was kind of immersed in this. Um, the Bible is full of this idea of jubilee. It's this philosophy in the Bible that um, at regular periods <laughs> Um, people's debts would be forgiven. And now we live in a debt-based economy, but we have no jubilee. And jubilee was originally part of the functioning of debt in society, but now we have no jubilee, so everyone is just in perpetual debt. Anyway, I wanted to make a performance about debt and about how debt influences our lives, and I could not find a way of doing that in a performative, big audience way. It had to be a small conversation, or I could not get to the material I wanted to get to. So that's, that's how it became that. Yeah. In my case, I, I do not only do one-to-one -one performance, but um, most of my work is based on environmental injustice. So, in some way, I'm trying always to find a new medium in order to bring change into the spectator. When you work with a bigger audience, it's difficult to have like a dialogue in depth with the participator. So, the format of one-to-one -one for me in this case was important because uh, the construction of a new future, it should be like a very intimate moment where the person can actually feel humble and uh, exposure his most secrets about himself and also how he's confronted with uh, society and what would be the somehow the things that he would miss if he would not be there anymore. So I think the format of one-to-one -one in this case is particularly important because of the conversation that gets into a more deeper level. And also because I'm working a lot on individual change, because I do believe that individual change do matter. And I feel that in this way, uh, if we work with one-to-one, -one, it brings even more opportunity to raise these changes in between people. So first off, I'm not sure I can give a perfect answer for this because we didn't create this piece. So it was created by our director, Silke Gabinger. And um, I can share what I remember of what she told of the, of the creation. And the, the first thing I do remember is that she wanted to create something short and personal for one audience. So it was a goal to create a one-on-one -on -one performance. And uh, the idea with the things that happened, without spoiling too much, was um, coming from the fact that she had a twin, that she ate in her mother's belly, that she never got to know, but uh, she, she had this feeling of there is another version of her, which was uh, part of it. And the other part is uh, the thing with the mask, how... Uh, all these things in the, as you look at yourself if you look at yourself in a mirror image because uh, it's not a perfect photo or something it's uh, it's inversed and uh, in this way looking at a person who is kind of like me but at the same time it's not me but reminds me very much of me like a twin 
and to to bring this in a very personal level would be the, the nice way to do it would be the one-on-one uh, -on -one thing. Um, well, I would say that I did not want to make a one-to-one -one performance. <laughs> um, I mean, for some of the reasons that Harry said, it's very laborious. So that's just a practical thing. Um, but I guess I also felt a resistance to the kind of presumed intimacy that that format often sets up. Um, and even though I am interested in, and I think the performance is intimate, sometimes I worry that it's too easy if you just have one audience member at a time. Um, but <laughs> I'm always trying to circle the content until the appropriate form of the work <coughs> until the work tells me what form it needs to be. And in this work I was really just continually fascinated with um, the experience of having an eye test, so in the opticians, that you go into this dark room with a stranger and they really look at you, or they really look into you, um, but in this very narrow lens of a kind of medical examination. But having been in those scenarios as a child, how sort of thrillingly intimate they felt that you would have this stranger kind of brush against your face with this light. So I suppose this was always this kind of vision that kept repeating the eye test. Um, so it had to be that, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, me, there were different things. Uh, one is that I, I created the show when I was broke, completely without... I had debts because of my last show. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, so I couldn't work with anybody. I did it on my own. And I rehearsed with the audience. During three months I was rehearsing two weeks on my own, one week with the audience, and that was the way it did. Then I work with theater of objects, manipulating objects, and I never could work that much on the way I wanted because I like a lot working with little things, but always you need like uh, projections or you need another way of working with them so people can see it. Uh, for once I thought, well, I can do it on the way I want to do it. And also the kinds of materials I really want to talk about, it's about memories about what we have in our pockets. So, at the end I thought, the simple, the simple way to do that, it's like if I was at home with my friends. And that's why I thought five is a nice number because they can sit around, they can see me, and it's like family or our lives. So, at the end it was a coincidence that make that very easy to rehearse, to create it, and also to go around and for the show actually it's the way it has to be done. Uh, so in my case it happened that uh, I, I never before did such format like speaking to a small number of people. I even didn't sign myself on the posters like Jan Turkowski because I was always thinking that it's funny to have different names and different names of the projects and so on but since this personal experience started to be quite intimate and strong on the line between the person who, who was a, an owner of all those films. I started to feel that I need to give as well something from myself on stage. Uh, before I, I didn't know that it will end in such format like talking to the people. I thought it might be a documental movie when I was recording all the meetings and so on. And, uh, and later on I figured out that it has to be some kind of a balance in this situation. You pick up somebody's life on the free market and then you talk about this, you make money out of that as well because it's like a show, you ask about this aspect. So of course it's very easy to go and to, to make somebody's life as a as an object to sell in a more advanced way, but still you are dealing with somebody's privacy. 
things and uh, I just ended in this um, situation where I had to disclose myself and I felt naked at the beginning and so on, but come on, you are an older guy and you can handle it. So that's the story of how it happened. Yeah, there, uh, I really like what you said about the exploitation of self because there is a nice binary that happens in the sense that you do a lot of labor and work throughout the day, but in the sense you are exploiting yourself as much as you're exploiting your audience member. And it seems that at least the performance that I've seen is one of ones, it's exploiting the audience to create you the narrative, in your, in your sense, to provide you with the material, the content of the death, with you to really go there <laughs> and with you, you, uh, you ask a, a certain gaze in order to be watched so it seems that this is a co-creation of exploitation in the sense and the other thing which, which I would now like to open up is this question of intimacy because on one hand yes two people in a shared space uh, especially because it becomes a little bit personal to the audience member but I what I find a little bit funny is that you have the appointment you know in this festival, you know that this is just your 8, 10, 20 minutes and um, yeah, I, I like the, the complexity of it and I don't know how you feel about it that it is a sort of a fake intimacy that you have to chip in just in this very short moment and an ophthalmologist reference is really kind of correct, I, I put a doctor's appointment Well, I'm also really fascinated by this kind of uh, friction because it's both true and not true. It is unique, but it is also repeated. And so, and I guess I'm curious about this line of intimacy and personal, like these words keep circulating, intimacy, exploitation, personal, um, and I guess in the content of my work, I'm interested in how much can you be seen? How much can you ask of someone? Um, and actually, when is the kind of stubborn line that says this and, and only this, or this moment, and then it's repeated to someone else? And what's going on, and I'm part of this too, when I see one to one performance, I have this desire for it to be for me. And is that because we're living more often in societies where everything is mass produced? Or what I'm interested in from the audience, and I'd like to hear from the audience later maybe, what that desire is to see work in this format. So I don't know, for me it's still a question. Yeah, I, I don't think it's as unusual as as you might be implying, I think our lives are full of this kind of intimacy. Like this is, I don't know, I have been going to therapy for 10 years. Like, I am very used to the idea of paying somebody to pretend to be my friend for an hour. <laughs> and this is also what, what theatre is. We, we pay to, to, to come and watch some people pretend to have emotions at it. And, but the, I do not think it is a false intimacy. I think this is the, this is the intimacy that is available. That, that when, there is, when, you, when there is a clear exchange, um, you, it enables a different kind of intimacy, a very bounded and, and regulated kind of intimacy to take place, where the people participating kind of understand what is, what is happening. This is, this is why people visit sex workers. Because, because they can have a bounded sexual experience where they know what is going to happen and everything is decided in advance. If they if, yeah, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. But um, uh, yeah, and, and in my performance, I, I, I've seen a lot of one-to-one -one performance where um, you know there is hugging or lying down. And I like this stuff um, where people are really trying to you know really be with another really be with them. Um, and I think this is already absurd. We know that this is a fake situation. We know this is a repeated situation. All situations are fake. You know, love is fake, romance is fake. So, so in my performance, I begin by trying to create a kind of barrier 
Um, so I, I do not look like this, I'm wearing a suit. I'm talking, I'm not talking like this, I'm talking in a very serious British accent that kind of conveys authority. So I'm trying to be an authority, I'm sat behind a desk, I'm, I'm creating this barrier because because if I put an authoritative barrier between me and the audience member, then across that barrier, an actual conversation can, can take place. They can trust me. And we have acknowledged that the situation is absurd. We have acknowledged the situation is fake. And once we have done that, then we can have a conversation. Um, I'd like to speak just for our performance now because I think that our performance, you don't, when you come in, like I don't want to spoil it, but when you come into the room, I think you kind of forget that this is an appointment because um, it, can, it, become, it can become very, very intimate and very emotional. And I think for most of our audience members, they're just living in, in the moment and they, they kind of forget what's happening, happening outside or that's, at least that's what my, um, how I see it because for me, the most interesting part of this one-on-one -on -one performance is that it's it's so interesting because every time it's totally different and every time as a performer you have to react on what the audience is giving you and every audience member gives you different, different things to work with um, and this is the most challenging part for me and also that in this one-on-one -on -one performance when you come as an audience member you kind of are forced to, to also react and to also participate in the um, performance, which is not always the case because when you go to the theater, you just sit there and watch the play and afterwards maybe you, you talk with friends or you just don't talk about it because it was shit or whatever. But um, in our performance, you kind of, you have to, to, to do something um, and this can throw people off. So they maybe are scared or they just don't talk with us, but some people really open up and then there can happen really emotional things and really awesome things that I think um, are like the, the core of our performance. Just uh, about this um, whole intimacy thing, that it's really... It gets just as intimate as, uh, as our viewer chooses to be. And we've, we've experienced both things when uh, when we really did exploit them, as you said. So so we really took everything they give and created the whole thing out of it. And there are those people who, for some reason, just serious, they just sit back and they want to be as far away from the performance as possible, to not be part of it, to not get intimate. And then this is something where, where I guess it's kind of turned around that uh, that I feel like I have to produce something because I'm not getting too much. And uh, as she said, it's really changing with each person that comes into the room of, uh, of how much is going to be I take from you or you take from me. And uh, how intimate or how personal you want your experience to become. Just because... Um... For me, it's like every like when the person comes into the room, I sometimes I feel the energy from the other person. I, I um, immediately feel some kind, some sort of connection to the other person, and with some, it's just nothing. It's just like a wall, and they just they look at me, but they they don't give me anything, and that's so interesting because from the moment they walk into the room, there is some kind of energy there, or there is not, and so I think this it's a very interesting aspect. Yeah. I would like to say something about the use of exploitation because I don't totally agree on this word uh, when we talk about exchange because for myself when I decide to take this position and do a performance one to one for me it's uh, more as an exchange because when you decide to actually commit yourself for such an intimate moment and it's yeah it's really hard work as we all know to work uh, in depth with eight people per day uh, but uh, I don't think that we are exploiting each other I think we are actually exchanging knowledge and I would say that it's when the person also decides to spend half an hour with that person is a deliberated choice 
And I think when we are sharing a, a sort of dialogue, you pose questions, but the person is also able to pose questions, uh, at least in my case, in my performance. So it's up to the performer and to the spectator to choose how they want to interact and what they would like to do. Uh, when there is not really a script, uh, I, I talk from my performance, I, I do have a sort of a guideline, but is much more about what happens in the dialogue, so the dialogue can be very fluid and we can actually go in towards different directions and every person that will come, it will be a different future and a different story. So I would more, in my case, I, I would not like to use the word of exploitation in any sense because I see it more as an exchange. Maybe this is a good now way to connect with the, because we talked about the audience experience and how, but what is the performer's experience and what do you do with the material that you kind of collect through this, all of these appointments and sharing and, and the community do, uh, do you break it? Does it progress with the performance? The more experiences you better or do you collect it for some other project or two ways to make it more complex? I think for me, um, from performance to performance, I get more creative because I see what people could be willing to give me, so I kind of react to that and it's just I gain experience and, and I, get to, I just get more ideas of what I could show them or with what I could trigger them to participate in the performance. Um, I'm, a, I'm an obsessive uh, documenter of my my work in general, and I just document obsessively, so for this performance, and it is part of the performance which for me, if it's not finished in the room, I often have longer email exchanges with, with my participants if they, if they want them, because I send them a record of our session and then we talk about it. Um, so it, you can find it on my website and we might try and print it out for the room, I have these, um, these complicated reports of everything that has happened in, in my session with like, uh, graphs and charts and, and numbers and all of this. So I do collect all the information and then anonymize it and, and turn it into reports of the performance. So I do this. Um, but then the other thing that's going on is oh, it's it's to do with rehearsal and, and, and practice and what you were saying. The longer I've done this, the better I have got at at it. Like my job as a performer in this performance is to is to as quickly and as effectively and as kindly as I can to get inside somebody. Um, and break down whatever barrier they have and open them up and hurt them uh, and then heal them again. Like that, that is what I am trying to do in, in 20 minutes. It, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it, it doesn't work. It, it depends on the person, but I have to understand who this person is, what they are bringing to the performance, how I can make them feel something. And, and, <coughs> and so I have got better at that over time and I can do that more efficiently. But then when you get efficient at it, you start also to get complacent and you so sometimes you can just go through the motions and, and forget to really pay attention to somebody and look in their eyes and think, ah, this is where I can reach inside you. Pull something. <laughs> I'm sounding very cynical in these answers, but actually, I don't know, you, you'll have to talk to people who've done the session. I think I'm actually very gentle and, and kind and nice to people in a very silly way, but um, inside I'm thinking, ah. Uh -huh. In my case, um, as it's a performance about that also brings the the question about the relation between human and nature. Um, I think for me, I'm not really interested about the documentation of the project. Uh, for me, it's more about what happens to this person afterwards. So this change that will come afterwards when the person leaves the performance, and you'll think maybe maybe later on. Uh, in few aspects, if uh, it goes back in trajectory in the way that this person is relating to nature and how uh, is inserting into a capitalism form, uh, I would more think about the, what happened after to this person as a maybe documentation, walking documentation, then for the com documentation of the project itself. I do uh, record the, the performance but I do not use the, the footage in any uh, way. Uh, I think what I only do is that 
at the end of the, the week, I kind of uh, write down the, the things that had changed for me uh, throughout that the people said to myself uh, that somehow touched me and uh, I make a text out of it. So that's how I kind of uh, document the performance. Thank you, right. Um, I think, like Mariam, I'm also not interested in a way of documenting these experiences because, because for me, it ha if, if it's working, then it's working in that live moment. Um, and I love the ephemeral experience in my work. I meet you once in a moment of light, and that's what we're left with. So this is like a, a camera flash and it lasts for a few seconds and for me that's what I take away. I don't remember everyone's face but I kind of feel like, well I feel quite privileged to have done this performance many times and had these faces appear out of the darkness. And I used to give people a, a, a piece of paper where they could write back to me because there was this um, people don't speak in the performance, it's quite choreographed um, but, and it felt like people wanted a way of replying and I think they might but for me I just want it to be held in that live, ephemeral, non-held moment.
they are not alone in their experiences, but, uh, but it gives as well the, the, the feeling that we build a society of the people who have a very sensitive memory and sensitive memory and, and we are attached to some uh, personal things in a, in a certain way. So I think this is what would they give me what they give me always and I try to give it further during this meeting. I just had this thought right now that about documentation. We do make a picture of everyone that we perform for, and uh, of course we use it for absolutely nothing, and we absolutely don't publish it and don't do anything with it. But uh, I realized it became kind of a, a side dish. If the performer is the main performance is the main course, my side dish is to to just flip through these pictures as we're always a team, but uh, one performs, one talks with the audience to clear up what's happening. And at the moment now on the computer we have around 200 pictures and I flip through them and I remember all the faces. And all of them come with a different emotion, a different memory. And funny enough, I do remember all the performances. I remember if I talked with this person or if I performed for this person, but it's kind of like a, an extra thing that I just get out for myself from this performance. Yeah, and I would, yeah, maybe I would open the discussion for the audience because I just realized that it's much more suited than this type of <laughs> discussion. So if anyone has a question, maybe it's a, it's a good time. I would just like to finish this, this round with a, with a question that was partially answered. It is, uh, for you personally, what, what sort of an outcome are you wishing for for this performance? Is what sort of a trigger you want to kind of evoke, or uh, what, what would you like to provide for your audience member in, in a most you know ideal way? I, I think I already answered somehow this question. I think it's about change, uh, about the way we live with capitalism system and the political system with how we deal with nature and how we are growing towards uh, collapse uh, if we don't do something to change now so I think what I aim with this performance is to bring somehow individual change but it's very subjective <laughs> so this is my hope and this is the hope that I try to bring to people and I'm very sorry but I also have to leave now <laughs> Um, I want each uh, audience member, participant, I want each <coughs> participant to be more awake to how uh, the idea of obligation is structuring their life, how the idea of debt is structuring their life. Um, I think most of the people, I think a lot of people kind of walk around just sort of carrying this weight of obligation. Like all the conversations I have with people are like, oh, I feel like I should be doing this for my mother, and I feel like I should be doing this for, and I, I don't, I'm not politically involved enough, and oh, I have so many carbon emissions, and like I want people to be a bit more awake about how obligation has structured their life, and then I want them to feel a little lighter about it. And, and my personal mission is to try and get people to forgive themselves for something. Um, I want them to let go of a debt. Um, I don't always manage this, and sometimes they don't want to, and that is okay. But if they have not forgiven themselves, then I at least want them to feel a little bit lighter about it. Although sometimes I watch, and, I, and they look heavier because I've made them remember. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to make them remember, and then feel lighter. But sometimes they just remember and then feel terrible. It's okay. I think my main goal for the audience is just that they have fun and enjoy themselves and I want to give them space to to do whatever they feel like doing and to share whatever they feel like sharing um, to become emotional, to, to, to have fun, to have a conversation and what I personally take out of it is I think every time someone opens up to you and just talks to you about their feelings you gain something, whether it's in, in the frame of a performance or you just talk with someone. Um, and I think that every performance I do, I, I just 
I, I meet another person and I get to, to know this person a little bit and I automatically gain experience from that and just, just by interacting with this person and that's what I find very interesting. So, in my case, this uh, ideal impact on audience will be very banal, they're spiritual, you know, and I'm trying to say to the people that uh, all those documents, all those photos and all those memories we collect, they are just, and we, we expect that they will last forever or we will have 80 years old and we will sit in front of the TV and watch them once again and then remember and talk, tell stories and so on. But it's actually very easy just to be away. Even you are still alive, you are not able to participate in your past. Okay, so this famous here and now, it's most important and so on. I think it's something about that. It's, it's not, I'm not talking about this in direct way, but without, with many examples of, uh, of the person who is attached to the uh, memories and looking through the photos and is obsessed as well with the documentation of different forms of, uh, of dealing with it uh, because uh, once we need to leave this place for good and probably this exercise in the theater is sometimes quite good to imagine how it would be if, uh, if we are about to leave. I would say I don't want a particular outcome, um, but I, I definitely have a particular request or provocation, which is I agree to, in that moment, try and be there and be seen as much as that is humanly possible, and there's the opportunity for that person in return to do the same and for us to see each other. Um, but I'm not really attached to whether that happens or not. I like it to happen, of course. I think it's good <laughs> to be seen. Um, but I think, for me, this is what we're always battling. How possible is it to meet someone across this great divide of two bodies? And for me, it's as interesting when I notice someone holding back, not wanting to look in at me, because this is also the outcome, this is, this is uh, how it is to live in a, in a body that has a skin membrane that keeps you solid. Um, so yeah, for me it's about, I, I guess Maria was talking about exchange, I, I would also say that like invitation, here's an invitation to look, and then dot dot dot, yeah. are not that usual and uh, this form is not that practiced. So I would like to ask what is your experience of the audience till now? Of an audience who is actually not used to this or most probably not familiar at all? Uh, two days so far and uh, two very very different days uh, I don't know if it's the time of the day that is different because we do perform at daytime this time or the region or the people if uh, they are so used to theater and so used to sitting back uh, but on the first day we did get very very surprisingly passive people and it was a real challenge to perform because it was um, 
you know, like you, we would have to get the information out of them with a uh, follow-up. Uh, the <laughs> yeah, that we, we really need to train them to, to be part of it. And on the other hand, yesterday was uh, a completely different day where we had uh, audience that was really participating, who was, uh, who was active, who was uh, responsive, who was uh, unexpected even. So, and I did question myself if this is something to do with the region, if, uh, if the people are different. I don't know, like first day, maybe only passive people want to get over it fast. And then, <laughs> and then the more excited people want to get to the end. I don't know what is uh, the thing that changing what people come, but we have two very different days. We're also looking forward for today, like the people of what they're going to bring us today. So I don't find any trouble in participation. 
But the one thing I do find, and I think this is because, because it is less common here than in Britain, and you know, there's not that many people doing one-to-one -one performances, but if you go to a contemporary performance festival in Britain, there is usually at least one-to-one, one one-to-one -one, one -one performance, I think. Um, in Britain, I often encounter the kind of participants, and they're usually men, um, who, who sort of sit down and they're like, I'm going to do this performance so well. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you expect, ha ha ha. And they, wanna, they want to trick you or they want to beat your performance somehow. They're trying to win, you know? Um, because they, they think they are experienced at one-to-one -one performances, so they're trying to win. And uh, this, is, this is the most annoying kind of participant. And, uh, uh, but they are also the most fun to break. Because I'm like, oh, you're going to beat me. I'm going to beat you. Um, and I find a way to I find a way to try and twist them and make them feel more uncomfortable than they expect. And that I've, that has not happened to me <laughs> in Central and Eastern Europe. I think because the, the format is less familiar. Uh, but it ha I, there's always one in, in, every day in Britain where they're, they're trying to win.